Okay, good morning. Welcome back. Uh, great to have everybody back for this next session. Uh, we'll be talking about human health in space. And um, this is part one. This is a two part uh, event here. So uh, we're really excited about this one. Our session chair for this uh, this session is Sarah Ayal. I hope I'm pronouncing that right. Um, she is faculty at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem and a consultant uh, to Space Pharma. This session includes four presentations. We can see them here on the screen. Um, lots of great acronyms in this one. Um, so hope everybody enjoys these. And then without further ado, uh, please, oh, actually, sorry, one more thing. Please remember to submit your questions using the Q&A tool at the bottom of your screen. Uh, just click on that and submit your questions. Please don't put them in the chat. Uh, really tough for our presenters to see. So put them in the Q&A tool and ask away. There's uh, no such thing as a bad question. So please do that. And uh, without any more uh, information to give you, let's get started with the presentations. Good morning. I'm Filippo Giorgio Di Girolamo and I'm here today as co-PI to present on behalf of the whole Professor Biolo Research Group and our research partner Kaiser Italia, the Nutris experiment. First of all, I wish to thank the Italian Space Agency for supporting our idea and Argotec and Telespazio to make it possible. Our proposal stems from the question, when you land, can you stand? It is known that long-term space flight induces relevant changes in body mass and composition. Microgravity almost invariably leads to a 1 to 5% loss of body mass, in particular to a quali-quantitative loss of muscle mass and gain of fat. These changes in body composition are strictly related also to a derangement of protein and glucose metabolism. Results from bed rest studies, a model simulating the microgravity condition occurring in space, and few studies during human space flight show that a nutritional intervention counteracts or at least limits the detrimental effect of microgravity on skeletal muscle mass and metabolism. Optimal monitoring and feedback tanning on nutrition would allow a sustainable metabolic control of microgravity drawbacks and muscle skeletal system in astronauts. The Nutris experiment is a proof of concept study aiming to monitor the body composition of an astronaut and, if needed, to provide nutritional advice during the flight. Recently, we published a methodological paper on how we conduct such a research. Our protocol recruited one astronaut and was conducted between July 2019 and January 2020. Besides the assessment on ground of astronaut nutritional status, complete metabolic laboratory and clinical pattern, and a nutritional questionnaire to evaluate his energy consumption, the innovation of our protocol was to assess and eventually correct, during flight, potential body composition changes. Body composition can be easily assessed by a bioimpedance instrument. If body weight or mass is known, a bioimpedance instrument can quickly evaluate percentage or absolute fat-free mass and fat mass. Therefore, the first step is to get the body mass. In agreement with all the space agencies, we collected this data by using the body mass measurement device. Bioimpedance measurement was carried out with a commercial off-the-shelf instrument, customized to be used on board of the IS. The European Space Agency enabled us to use the Everywhere app to provide the, to the astronaut the nutritional suggestions when required. This application keeps a daily dietary log and translates the recorded food in amount of macro and micronutrient 
and also the application sets a nutritional target in terms of protein, fat and carbohydrates in order to guide the astronaut. A diagram here in the bottom showed the whole protocol. We can conclude that the combined use of the body mass measurement device, the bioimpedance analysis and the Everywhere app can prevent the significant changes in fat mass during the whole space flight can maintain a near neutral energy balance and can contribute to the observed stability of fat-free mass and muscle mass throughout the mission. Of course, a constant level of aerobic and resistance exercise contributed to the success of this protocol. For privacy reasons, results from the study are now classified. However, we can anticipate that our study is now in the process for an extension, since collected data improved physical performance and quality of life of the astronaut during both the space flight and the recovery phase on Earth. This data will also have an important impact on clinical management of malnourished, immobilized and bedridden patients on Earth. The Italian Space Agency in the past, a few astronauts reported mild hearing loss after long-term mission on the International Space Station. The noise levels on the International Space Station are insufficient to explain hearing losses due to exposure to noise only. Therefore, we must investigate the possible adverse effect of microgravity on hearing. Microgravity increases intracranial fluid pressure, which may alter the transmission properties of the middle ear and damage the cochlear outer hair cells. Performing audiometric measurements in a noisy environment may be a challenging task. Photoacoustic emissions provide a fast, objective and non-invasive hearing test that works nicely also in a noisy environment. Twenty years ago, Bucky also already proposed using OAEs to monitor the astronaut's hearing. Photoacoustic emissions are acoustic signals generated in the human cochlea and measured in the ear canal. Their magnitude is related to hearing sensitivity, their phase to the frequency resolution of hearing. The human cochlea is a fluid-filled cavity divided by an elastic membrane, the basilar membrane, whose resonance frequency is a decreasing function of the longitudinal coordinate. Slow acoustical traveling waves propagate along it. Due to the tonotopic properties of the basilar membrane, the acoustic energy of the incoming sound is partially dispersed according to frequency. For each frequency component of the traveling wave, active amplification is performed at the resonant place by the outer hair cells. The gain of the outer hair cells amplifier is about 40 dB. Damage to the outer hair cells immediately leads to hearing loss. Three Highly innovative features have been implemented in the acoustic diagnostics prototype. The time frequency filtering of the distortion product response, the calibration in the ear canal of the forward pressure, and the two stage acoustic insulation system. Taken together, all these improvements guarantee stability of the stimulus independent of the probe insertion depth, high sensitivity and the insulation from ambient noise. Due to the cochlear nonlinearity, additional tones may be generated at intermodulation frequencies. They are called distortion products and we can measure them by inserting in the ear canal a probe integrating one loudspeaker and a loud noise microphone. Acoustic Diagnostics is a lightweight sensitive DPOE testing device 
especially designed for testing the astronaut steering on the International Space Station. Two astronauts have already been tested before, during and after their long-term missions on the ISS. The measures were performed with the acoustic diagnostics device by the astronauts themselves. Cochlear sensitivity, frequency resolution and middle ear impedance were monitored using a single device. The noise floor of the measurements were very low and comparable to those measured in the baseline data collection. The sensitive hearing diagnostic tool that we have developed for the International Space Station will find the application also in clinical audiology, occupational health, legal medicine and so on. Other astronauts are currently being enrolled in the study, so we should be able to assess or exclude adverse effects of microgravity on astronaut hearing. Hello everybody. This is a brief executive summary of the key points that we make in our presentation introducing HiFi, the next generation of exercise countermeasures. The bulk of that presentation is concerned with showing how HiFi meets some of the three key challenges for next generation countermeasures. And so I'm briefly going to run through those challenges in turn here. The first challenge is to optimize a training stimulus. Currently, astronauts on ISS spend around 25% of their working day exercising. But when they return to Earth, it's still common for astronauts to have experienced considerable deconditioning. And so there's a lot of interest in finding an exercise countermeasure which can fully ameliorate the deconditioning whilst being able to be performed in less time. One exciting avenue of interest is looking at repeated jumping. And one reason why this seems so promising is that the European Space Agency have performed a bed rest study where they showed that repeated jumping could completely ameliorate the deconditioning experienced by people who were undergoing bed rest. Clearly, however, it's not easy to jump in space. And so the purpose of HiFi is to provide equipment that allows this activity. So in brief, HiFi is a horizontal jump sled where the resistance is provided by high tensile springs. One reason why jumping is such an effective exercise countermeasure is because it results in very high impact forces. However, that then leads to the next challenge, which is that we need to minimize the transmission of these forces to the spacecraft. And HiFi solves this problem in a very elegant way. And that is that there's an upper and a lower carriage that move synchronously opposite to one another and where the springs provide a resistance that opposes the separation of the two carriages. And so what that means is that the forces that are acting on the two carriages are equal and opposite to each other. And so the net force acting on HiFi is zero. In order to understand the final challenge, we need to think a little bit about the current approach to exercise on ISS. And in particular, there are three exercise devices on ISS. And this is disadvantageous because they take up a lot of space and also quite a lot of time to set up and break down after each exercise session. And so then a third key advantage of HiFi is that it's very compact. And as you've seen in this video, preparation for exercise is very swift. So as you've seen in this presentation, HiFi currently exists as a fully working prototype. So what are our next steps? Well, we need to prove that 
hi-fi can be used in microgravity and that forced transmission to the spacecraft is minimized. So to this end, we've partnered with the European Space Agency and in particular the European Astronaut Center in order to gain access to a parabolic flight campaign. And so next year, the UK Space Agency will be funding us to travel to France to put Hi-Fi through its paces in microgravity. So I hope this brief summary has piqued your interest enough to watch our full presentation. If you do have any questions, please do get in touch with us. And also I'd invite you to follow Hi-Fi on social media as we have lots of plans to share our progress and the performance of Hi-Fi in the Parabolic Flight Campaign. Thank you very much. This executive summary synthetically presents the content of the talk Nanoros and Noemi projects aboard the ISS, nanotechnology antioxidants for muscle cell protection in space, retrievable with ID 304 on the ISS R&D conference website. Both projects were conceived and developed by the Smart Biointerfaces group of the Istituto Italiano di Tecnologia. Nanoros project was funded by the Agenzia Spaziale Italiana and conducted in partnership with Kaiser Italia and Scuola Superiore Sant'Anna, whereas Noemi project was selected by the European Space Agency, funded by Fondazione Cariplo and conducted in partnership with Kaiser Italia. Both projects were performed with the support of NASA, Kennedy Space Center, and aimed at testing innovative nanotechnological antioxidants against loss of muscle mass and force, typically affecting astronauts in space and humans due to aging and pathology onset on Earth. To the purpose, dispersions of serum oxide nanoparticles, featuring self-renewable and biomimetic antioxidant effect, were supplied to muscle cell cultures, both in proliferative and differentiative conditions of different duration aboard the ISS, where cultures were delivered to in fully automated fluidic systems qualified for spaceflight. Nanoparticles were hypothesized to protect cultures from oxidative stress induced from altered gravity and cosmic radiations. Both projects require transcriptional studies that were performed with microarray analysis, next generation sequencing, and bioinformatics tools after flight. Lists of differentially expressed genes were thus produced, and the results underwent hierarchical clustering and gene ontology studies, as well as representation with Venn diagrams, all of which will be presented in the full talk. Collectively, both projects demonstrate significant influence of space environment on cultures, as well as regulatory effects ascribable to nanoparticle administration, with effects on cytoskeleton, mitochondria and nucleoli that deserve validation in altered gravity conditions and at a translational level in the next future. Okay, uh, very good. Uh, excellent presentations. Uh, interesting stuff. So uh, we have our session chair on with us, uh, Sarah, and I think it's E-all. Good to see you, Sarah. Thanks for being here. Um, we're going to take questions. Uh, again, please don't hesitate to submit any questions. We don't have any yet. Uh, using the Q&A tool down at the bottom of your screen down there, submit away. Um, and with that, I will turn it over to Sarah to uh, introduce and talk to our panelists. Thank you, Jim. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to you, wherever you are. We welcome to the first session on human health in space. And we have today a wonderful and multidisciplinary team of panelists. Let me introduce them to you. Uh, we have Filippo Giorgio Di Giolamo from the University of Trieste, and I hope I pronounced the name uh, right. We have um, Daniel, um, we have Arturo Moletti from the University of Roma, 
Tor Vergata, Daniel Clitter from St. Mary's University Twickenham, and um, Giada Graziana Genci from Institute, a postdoctoral fellow from Instituto Italiano di Tecnologia. And welcome. Uh, I'll start with a couple of pre-submitted uh, questions, which I uh, took the freedom, I hope you don't mind, to slightly modify them. The first question regards the, um, uh, the measurement of the changes in a uh, hearing. And um, I, the question was about the specificity of the device to astronauts and whether the targets that you measure in space are different from those that you uh, measure on Earth and whether you think that there are um, effects other than uh, or affecting factors other than microgravity. You mentioned noise, but not necessarily other factors. No, good morning and uh, good afternoon, <laughs> according to where you are. And um, yes, uh, the autoacoustic emission diagnostics is not specific to astronauts or space uh, diagnostics of hearing, of course. Uh, we use the same diagnostics uh, in uh, hospitals uh, to perform accurate measurement uh, of uh, the hearing sensitivity on any subject with uh, low hearing levels. With uh, these subjects, we need uh, high sensitivity to detect a very faint sound, uh, very close to the noise level. In space, the noise uh, environmental level in, on the space station is high, so we need uh, a particularly sensitive device. But uh, the target, uh, the outcome variable is the same that we use uh, in uh, daily routine measurement uh, in a, a clinical audiology. And uh, the second question was uh, so, about... Uh, the question, um, let me extend it a little bit. Um, do you think that radiation is a major a factor or will be a major factor, for example, in deep space uh, travels? Uh, we don't expect that, but uh, we do not exclude it uh, um, altogether. Uh, the main issues with the hearing sensitivity and the hearing loss are noise and uh, the intracranial pressure may play a role uh, as well. Um, the effects of uh, radiation are not uh, known to my knowledge. Mm -hmm. Okay, the bones that transmit the oscillations, anything changes there or there is no knowledge about it? The, you... the three bones that you showed in your uh, picture, which... Uh, the middle ear, yes. Yes, in the middle ear. The transmission of the middle ear is likely to be affected by the changes in intracranial pressure. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is something that we should monitor uh, uh, during uh, the permanence of the astronauts because uh, some uh, homeostatic uh, uh, mechanism could uh, recover the transmission of the middle ear during the first weeks or months on board uh, the station. For this reason, we perform a, a series of measurements and we also developed a diagnostics which is sensitive not only to the sensitivity of the inner ear of the cochlea, but also to the transmission of the middle ear because our calibration system measures the, the input impedance of the system, which is strictly related to the transmission properties of the middle ear. So we have this additional monitor, which is not present, present in typical uh, autoacoustic uh, commercial devices. Okay, thank you. Um, the other question, the pre-submitted question, regarded the uh, everywhere de device, and it was a uh, again uh, about the changes that occur in space and whether 
this is something which is uh, space specific. Um, I would like to ask whether the conditions, also to add to this question, whether the conditions on the ISS can affect the performance of the e-device. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> uh, um, probably you mean you, um, about the bioimpedance or, or the everywhere up? Because uh, uh, okay. you asked about the ev the everywhere app, but uh, yeah, yeah the but everywhere app uh, is an application uh, um, um, used by the European Space Agency. Uh, they they only uh, allow us uh, to use this application for um, uh, for, for our protocol. Uh, okay. Uh, so uh, the, 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 this was just a tool for us. Uh, the, our our main instrument uh, um, is the bioimpedance because this instrument uh, uh, was not uh, um, present in the ISS uh, uh, until uh, our our protocol uh, was uh, uh, approved. Uh, the Everywhere app uh, is a. I, I think that uh, the NASA has a, another application, a similar application like the Everywhere app. This is a, an application that uh, um, uh, can give us two uh, main information. The first information is about the uh, real um, energy um, consumption of the astronaut in terms of macro and micronutrients. So uh, we can see uh, every, every time that an astronaut uh, uh, eats a food or also, uh, or just a, um, a part of a, of a, of a pre, pre, um, uh, pre prepared food, uh, he can uh, just um, flash uh, the, 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 the package. Uh, and uh, and then we know exactly uh, what he ate uh, in terms of protein, carbohydrates, and and, and fat present in that food. Uh, so with this application, um, uh, we can uh, um, um, set a target of macro and micronutrients that every astronaut uh, uh, must re reach. Uh, to have an optimal uh, um, energy uh, intake, uh, um, of course, uh, 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 after that we have evaluated the, the energy consumption. Uh, to calculate the energy consumption, uh, till now we, the, we, we have just used the balance that, 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 uh, that uh, is present in the ISS. Uh, and and, and of course, the, the um, um, exercise instrument uh, uh, that can uh, um, uh, calculate uh, the, by which the, we, we, we can calculate the energy consumption. Uh, but uh, uh, to uh, understand, to better understand the energy uh, uh, requirement uh, with the bioimpedance, uh, we can assess uh, a good. Uh, um, uh, evaluation of the body composition of an astronaut in terms of uh, fat mass and muscle mass in kilos, of course, and, and uh, 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 related to the uh, increasing of fat mass and decreasing of, of muscle mass, this is our expectation, of course, uh, we can uh, uh, balance the, the, the energy intake uh, uh, with the uh, everywhere up. Then we set a new target every month uh, uh, and we can say to the astronaut, okay, now please eat uh, more uh, food, more uh, energetic food or more proteic food. J just to um, uh, have an astronaut uh, that can have a, a better quality of life during his space flight and of course uh, a better uh, quality of landing and uh, rehabilitation. That, okay, excellent. Yeah, we'll get that back to that later. I have a couple of more questions, uh, but we'll switch to the Q and A uh, questions. So the um, one question was uh, about the high frame, and do you predict? 
high levels of acceptability or likelihood of usage compared to traditional exercise? Hi, uh, thank you for the question. Um, I hope so. Uh, I, I think Hi-Fi you know, has some advantages which would make, make it acceptable. Um, so I guess the, the first or, or one of the most important ones is that kind of the, the, ex, the length of the exercise bout that we'd anticipate people would need to take part in in order to avoid um, adaptation is much, much smaller. Um, than than is seen with traditional modes of exercise uh so in the ESA bed rest study where they looked at what the effect of uh repeated jumping was on on ameliorating um deconditioning those participants were only jumping for three or four minutes per day um so that that's not a very onerous um uh, onerous task to take part in um and then i i guess the, the other th reason why we would hope that Hi-Fi is, is pretty acceptable is that, although you didn't see it on the executive summary, it, it is a multimodal exercise device. Um, so it's not just, okay, doing jumping. Uh, there's also a whole wealth of other things that, that you can do on Hi-Fi. Thank you. And there was another question uh, which related to the weight of this device compared to the weight of other exercise devices already on the ISS. Yeah, so it's a hard question to answer. Um, like current, the, the prototype version of Hi-Fi is pretty heavy, um, relatively. It's about 200 kilos. Um, but clearly that won't be the device that would actually fly. Um, so it, 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 a, a flyable device will be made com from completely different materials. Um, but, it, but even having said that, I think, you know, the, the proposition with Hi-Fi would be, okay, you just have one device and the, the vibration minimization, additional vibration minimization that you'd need would hopefully be minimized. And if you compare that to the current, which is three devices, all of which uh, result in substantial force transmission or can result in substantial force or vibration transmission that okay one one device that's optimized to minimize force transfer versus three devices that aren't as well optimized uh, i would imagine that hi-fi you know ultimately will end up you know requiring a lot less mass uh, yeah well i can see how the reduced vibration uh, issue can uh, improve goals of crystals and all the other experiments that are conducted and many other uh, functions of the ISIS. Okay, thanks. And one more for you before we switch to, uh, there was a question about vibration. I think you just answered it. Um, la one more question for you before we switch to the other speakers. Um, are there concerns for back and knee damage in your system? Um, I, I don't think any, any more concerns than you would normally have in any other activity. Um, I, I know that kind of, I mean, it, th there's a lot of force being expressed when you're using hi-fi and that's, that's desirable because that's the stimulus that we're looking for, for adaptation. Um, but, you know, terrestrially, lots and lots of people do lots and lots of jumping when they play their sport, uh, basketball players, volleyball players, handball players, um, you know, that, that, I, I don't, you know, the, I think, yeah, the, the, there's no, um, you know, particularly additional risk. Um, the, the other thing about hi-fi is that the dosage of, of the, the stimulus that we're giving is, is very, very controllable uh, because we know what the spring tension is. We're, we're engaged in modeling work to try and you know, really be able to quantify very, very well what are the forces that we're putting through the musculoskeletal system. And so, you know, we, we want to be really, really optimizing the stimulus. So we're just giving the optimal stimulus to pre prevent deconditioning, but not overcooking it or doing any more. Yeah, I, thanks. I have more questions about it, but this can wait. So let's switch to Filippo. Filippo, there is a question for you about the uh, conducting the experiment in one astronaut. And I mean, you explained that this is kind of a preliminary study before extending, extending the number and uh, the issue of a 
privacy and so on, but uh, what can you gain from, and slightly switching, uh, changing the question, what can you gain from a study in one person? Okay, <clears throat> well, first of all, we, uh, we, uh, we get the uh, feasibility of the protocol in terms of uh, astronaut time uh, consuming uh, because we, uh, okay, we know that by impedance analysis uh, on Earth uh, is, very, is very quick, is very simple, is very uh, ready to use instrument. But uh, uh, once you move to, uh, to the space, I learned because <laughs> of course uh, that uh, every, everything is slow, is lower. Uh, so um, uh, we 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 just want to know how long the 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 measurement uh, lasts because it, it was just a perception our 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 hypothesis uh, and then uh, so the 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 protocol is uh, uh, feasible on space first of all. Uh, the second thing uh, is that uh, we basically uh, change, we ask to change uh, the, the, the normal protocol to assess the nutritional status of an astronaut before um, a flight, during flight, and also uh, um, when he lands. Uh, because uh, we have assessed the uh, nutritional, um, the energy, uh, requirement of the astronaut uh, with uh, a, a nutritional questionnaire with a, 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 an expert dietitian, and uh, we made our uh, our analysis, our um, our our we have our number in terms of energy um, uh, energy requirement that was different uh, 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 different by the um, calcul the, the calculation made by the uh, is a nutrition, nutritionist. Um, and our, <laughs> our, our protocol was better. Now I can say that our protocol was better. Then uh, uh, for the first time, uh, we changed the um, uh, 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 energy consumption of, of the astronaut every month, by by, by month, for all the flight. Uh, this uh, this ha had an impact uh, not, not only uh, in the nutrition part, but also, of course, uh, in the um, exercise uh, uh, part of the astronaut life. Um, uh, we, we have, uh, uh, of course, some uh, um, some statement that we didn't change, uh, like the protein intake, uh, and uh, we we cannot, uh, we never affect the 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 type of exercise, of course, but uh, uh, we we learned uh, day by day uh, how to improve uh, our protocol, um, and uh, we have. Uh, um, Every day, every every month, we have a, a, a teleconference with the um, flight surgeons, of course, because uh, this has an impact in the health status of the astronaut. So everything was approved, pre-approved by the, the flight surgeons. So all these things uh, need to be uh, tested before to have a, a real uh, a real study uh, to 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 make a, a statistical inference uh, in, with the numbers. Now uh, that uh, all the things get well, we can say this. Uh, they they ask us to uh, continue our study with another astronaut, and, and with two with two astronauts, we can we can maybe we can publish something, of course, <laughs> because of privacy. We can we cannot share the the, the, the numbers, um, and uh, we have already applied uh, for for the new pro, uh, for the new call. Uh, of course, for other four astronauts. So uh, with six astronauts, maybe we, we can have uh, something more solid. Okay, that's it. Wonderful, thank you. I, well, this is very common. The twin study was conducted in one twin in space and was published in Science. This is something. I know. Yeah, we, okay. We, we tried to use this, uh, this, <laughs> this uh, uh, argument, uh, but... This example, yes. <laughs> <laughs> 
I wish this can be published in the uh, science. Good luck. <laughs> okay, so the next question is for Giada, and please correct me if I mis mispronounce your name. Uh, the question was about the status of nanotechnology, antioxidants, uh, at the cell level and system level on Earth. What do we know about it now? Okay, so thank you for your question. So there is a lot of efforts currently ongoing on the study of uh, antioxidants uh, with nanometric size on Earth, both from an, uh, an organic uh, composition and an, an inorganic composition. Uh, currently, there is a lot of different types of uh, uh, nano antioxidants and many of these uh, uh, classes exhibit the interesting feature of having uh, dual behavior, working as antioxidants and also uh, pro-oxidants depending on the specific target that they target. And um, as far as I can tell you, our, our group is currently interested to deepening the knowledge about these nanoparticles, the nanosystems that we tested on board the International Space Station with an ongoing pro project funded, co-funded by the European Space Agency called Intergravity, um, mostly aiming at uh, in understanding the interaction of nanometric antioxidants with biological systems in vitro. As far as I can tell you, uh, we also tested, uh, in particular, serum oxide nanoparticles also in vivo with, with very interesting results concerning uh, uh, regulation of transcriptional levels of many interesting genes uh, involved in adipogenesis, but also the hormone levels of uh, animals, in particular rats, that were administered with our nanoparticles. So there is very, uh, a very large effort in the scientific community, but very little has been dedicated to the, to the, in, in, in the, to the study of these materials under um, altered gravity conditions by cons taking into consideration uh, both hypergravity and microgravity, and also exposure to cosmic radiations. Uh, so our study, studies uh, performed on board the International Space Station in the, uh, 2017 and 2019 aimed at, aimed at decoupling these effects uh, under microgravity effects and uh, sorry conditions. And uh, currently, as what we can say is that we we found very important transcriptional regulation. Uh, upon nanomaterial administration and, uh, of course, exposure to, uh, to space conditions. So uh, we hope that we'll be, we will be able to draw in important information so has to bring transcriptional, level, uh, transcriptional studies uh, uh, to the scientific community, hoping to finding some uh, solutions to all of those conditions affecting astronauts in space based on uh, uh, pro-oxidant uh, oxidative stress. Thank you, wonderful. So um, until uh, more questions come from the audience, your projects are really, really interesting and I have questions of my own. So I'll continue with uh, questions about uh, your project, Giada. Um, the first question is about uh, the nanoparticles. Can, could you please tell us more about the nanoparticles themselves? Are they targeted? Are they uh, pedulated to protect uptake by macrophages? How do they do distribute in the body? Currently, we are studying uh, uh, part of nanoparticles of serum oxide um, just stabilized in water environment through a covalent uh, through a non-covalent coating represented by uh, fetal bovine serum. And uh, of course, uh, we are also developing other, uh, other, let's say, delivery platforms for these nanoparticles based also on lipids for their uh, capability of, uh, of uh, crossing biological barriers in a more effective way. Um, the interest, re interest revolving on these serum oxide nanoparticles relies on their, their antioxidant effect that's self-regenerative. So this would help having a rescue from the noxious effects of space environment for much longer term than expected from traditional antioxidants. So that's why 
these are useful candidates for enabling longer longer term stays in space but also having treatment of other pathological condition on earth even aging is associated to oxidative stress onset and maintenance because our biology means uh, uh, producing constantly oxidant chemicals chemical species but sometimes our body is not able to defeat this production in excess so that's why we need something to counteract this uh, excess of oxidative spe and chemical species in our body and this and this can be done with supplements typically food supplements but also with other supplements that can be also nanometric in size okay thanks and another question did you see different uh, differential uptake was uptake into cells different in space compared to the earth control well, we, uh, of course, we delivered our nanoparticles uh, in microgravity conditions. So we were not able to uh, assess the extent of internalization of our nanoparticles. But I can tell you these were effective even when just placed in the environment where cells were just staying. Because we cultured our cultures and uh, stat in uh, uh, adherent conditions. So our cultures were adherent to a substrate and they were placed in a fully automated uh, fluidic system and uh, they were fed with nanoparticles and cell culture medium in space. So the nanoparticles were freely <laughs> interacting with the, with the surface of the cells. Certainly we expect that part of these nanoparticles were also internalized but a very little amount. Indeed, honestly, the space effects were exceeding, uh, in, especially in the Noemi project, the effects of the nanoparticles. So we need to optimize the way we deliver these nanoparticles in our experiments in space. We will do so by doing on-ground experiments in the simulated microgravity. Um, and uh, because we recently acquired a random positioning machine, so we will be able to answer these questions soon. Mm -hmm. Thanks. So I have more questions, but I'll keep them for later. Uh, and my uh, next question is uh, it regards the high frame, and I would like to know whether it affects uh, muscles or bones in a different matter, manner compared to other devices, like other muscles are being more developed or preserved or preserved or whatsoever. Uh, uh, so. Yeah, I, I guess, you know, the, the major evidence that we have about repeated jumping is from this, uh, this ESA bed rest study. Uh, and, and yeah, the, what was impressive of for repeated jumping is that, yeah, it, it ameliorated the, the um, deconditioning effect uh, with, with very minor amount of exercise. And that, and that went across uh, muscle strength, bone mineral density, uh, and actually uh, a, a cardiovascular fitness. Um, I guess in, in terms of asking, does, uh, yeah, does, does it have a different effect compared to other devices? That's very dependent on what exercise you're doing. Um, so clearly in the bed rest study, the, there was little effect on, uh, compared to control on, on upper body measures because uh, that wasn't being trained. Uh, so yeah, I, I think, you know, the, 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 the advantage again about Hi-Fi is that it's a very flexible, uh, it's a very, very flexible exercise, piece of exercise equipment. So there's lots and lots of different activities that you can do on it. And, and quite a lot of activities that resistance training activities that aren't currently possible on A-RED. Um, so yeah, we think that, that, that there would be a, a wider kind of portfolio of exercises that you can perform with with hi-fi so that you have a more rounded um, uh, exercise countermeasure program. Great. Uh, can it be used by hospitalized patients like people who are uh, hospitalized for long periods? Yeah, we, we hope so. Um, so again, we have one that we have jumping is, is a very effective and efficient 
method. And then the, the advantage about HiFi again is that the dosage of exercise that's being delivered can be really, really precisely controlled. Uh, and again, in terms of the modeling work that we're doing, we aspire to be able to give an exercise dose that's more precisely controlled and delivered than, than anything that's possible at the moment um, by, by actually kind of having a, a, an idea as to what the forces that are being expressed both within bone and muscle are within that exercise activity. Um, so yeah, we're, we're pretty excited about the potential for HiFi to be used terrestrially in, in those sorts of health environments. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Um, a question for Arturo, um, which I didn't see earlier from the audience. Um, any correlation between hearing changes to visual changes? Uh, we would like to study these correlations because they are expected, because uh, intracranial pressure may affect both vision and hearing in principle. And uh, for this reason, we would like uh, to share our data with the group who's studying with a dedicated experiment the effect of microgravity on vision. Okay, thanks. We don't have a disagreement yet, <laughs> so <laughs> we have to be allowed to do this. We'd like very much to do this. Interesting. Uh, I'm looking forward to, <laughs> to see your, uh, the outcomes. Uh, what kind of diseases can it diagnose on Earth? The same uh, auto, <laughs> um, this device. What uh, uh, any speci have you validated it for any? Uh, yes, we we've, we've used uh, it on Earth, uh, on ground, very in um, a lot of situations. Uh, in hospitals, we've uh, used it uh, on the neuro neurological patients uh, to assess uh, their hearing, in um, which is usually not very good so we need a very sensitive instrument to detect uh, their low levels of hearing with high precision and with the device uh, very similar to the payload uh, of, of the ISS uh, we were able to demonstrate very recently that there is a laterality in uh, hearing in Parkinson patients um, that uh, mirrors uh, the laterality of hearing loss this is a very small effect and it needs a very sensitive device for being measured in subjects who are usually elderly and with the hearing loss, so the signals are very low. And this is a recent application of the same technology that we used in space. Of course, in space we also need to miniaturize a little more we need a lightweight and a small experiment but this was also only an additional constraint and we also use it to measure the sensitivity of hearing on the workplace of people exposed to noise and this is another uh, and in industrial environments usually noise, ambient noise is very high and uh, we have to perform the measurements uh, there. We cannot uh, go to audiometric booth uh, for doing these measurements. So the applications are uh, already uh, available. <laughs> okay, great. Um, one more question from the audience that showed up for me now. Um, again, for a photo, are there cumulative cumulative or dynamic noise exposure codings for each subject. Uh, it's from Paula Gugenic, or Genic, and she writes, I have heard levels can differ widely on station in various areas. Yes, uh, this is also a very good question. And in fact, uh, we asked the NASA to measure, uh, to help us uh, with their uh, devices uh, 
to measure, uh, which were already on board the station, to measure the ambient noise uh, near the head of the astronaut during our measurements. And so we have uh, a dynamic recording of the uh, noise levels uh, along the whole measurement, along the whole measurement session. And uh, in Columbus, uh, the noise levels are typically around uh, 55 uh, to 60 dBA. So they are uh, quite high from uh, our uh, measuring point of view. From a technological point of view, it's difficult to get uh, very good uh, measurements with uh, such an ambient noise. And for this reason, uh, our uh, instrument was equipped uh, with a two-stage uh, noise insulation system that worked uh, very nicely. And, but uh, in some uh, parts of the station, the noise levels are different, uh, that's right, and even higher, particularly during some activities uh, uh, performed by astronauts, uh, can, which can be very noisy. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Um, one question for whoever wants to answer. It seems that the ISS is the best, one of the best equipped uh, facility for medical studies per meter square. Um, do you see any similar facility uh, on Earth where you can gather all your inventions, plus inventions that were presented yesterday, such as uh, uh, miniaturic, uh, miniaturic uh, electron microscope and so on? Any similar place on Earth? Can you envision a facility like this and what it can be used for? other than in NASA. Well, <laughs> okay, let's move for the <laughs> if you, um, next one. Um, how do you see your um, inventions in five years from now? How would you like to see them? Um, of course, uh, we, we hope that uh, um, our this that this protocol that that now I call as Howard Protocol could be uh, the, the a normal uh, measurement uh, in the ISS for for an astronaut to have uh, um, uh, um, um, to have more attention of, on nutrition and physical activity because um, if we think to have a very long space flight to Mars, for example. Uh, then uh, for the health status, nutrition and physical activities uh, uh, become the two more important uh, things in, in our opinion, of course. Um, uh, otherwise, metabolic derangement uh, and, uh, and and uh, and body composition changes could be very very difficult to to counteract. Okay, thanks. Anyone else? Okay, uh, so oh yeah, Daniel. Oh, so just quickly, um, I, I I think yeah. We, we have a pretty strong vision of, of where we want to be. Um, and I guess we have kind of two avenues, like the, the first is space and then the second is terrestrially. Um, from, a, from a space point of view, uh, we, yeah, we'd like to see hi-fi or, or a, a version of hi-fi being used uh, you know, regularly as an exercise countermeasure in, in deep space exploration. Um, from a terrestrial point of view, uh, yeah, we, we, we'd like to show that repeated jumping and and very controlled dosage of exercise can be used across a, a range of health environments, um, from sort of osteoporosis, uh, patients who've undergone long-term bed rest, uh, through to other terrestrial environments where exercise countermeasures are needed. So, um, for for instance, submarines or you know other confined spaces. Um, yeah, wonderful, so, wonderful. So yeah, we well, thank you. Thank you, Daniel. Uh, so by this, I would like to, we're running out of time. So I would like to thank you all for coming here and for your wonderful presentation. And 
uh, hand it back to you, Jim. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you, Sarah. Um, and thank you to all of our fantastic panelists. You know, with, with 20 years of continuous humans uh, in space on the station and looking forward to uh, much uh, longer duration and uh, 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 missions, um, I think all of this research is critical. Um, and so I really applaud all of you for, for this work. Uh, and we thank you very much for being here and presenting. So we really appreciate it. Um, okay. So now it's time for a bit of a break. Um, and Sarah, thank you too. Uh, uh, forgive me, uh, that was excellent leadership of that session. So now we're gonna take a break. Uh, uh, we will break until 1650 Universal. Um, if that's, I think that's correct, right? Um, actually, uh, yeah, about, we'll go to noon Eastern. So uh, sorry, 1700 Universal when we'll reconvene in this same Zoom room for our next part of the day, the poster sessions. <laughs>